What if the election of the 45th President of the United States was not a fair fight? Power has always gone to those who knew how to convince, argue, and seduce. But this time? Donald Trump dismantled the traditional rules of political battle. He turned lying into a political strategy, supported by a group who wanted to impose their reactionary world vision on America. A faction that quietly mapped its way to power, managing to influence the race without the citizens being aware. How is this possible? How did American democracy allow lies, concealment, and manipulation to play such a large role in this incredible victory? You'll see the extent to which the American public was deceived, to the point of opening the doors of the White House to Donald Trump. and fake news came from Donald Trump's campaign. I think if Americans knew this was happening, they would be outraged. We just weren't mentally able at that point in time to see that coming. democracy taking place in darkness. It's not democracy. They're trying to, you know, take over the government of the United States and destroy it. You know? the facts plainly and honestly. The main problem with lies is that there's always someone who ends up believing them. Staten Island in New York. In a mostly democratic state, this suburb is an exception. Most of the people here voted for Donald Trump. Scott Labedo lives here, patriotic artist, and above all, a big supporter of the new president. He's unconventional. I am unconventional. I'm a New York City artist, and I've always been an outspoken I'm selling him for $45 because he's the 45th president. There's a new sheriff in town. In other words, we're gonna, we got a clean house. We're gonna kick some fucking ass. Did he need the media to win the fucking election when the, it, it was stacked against him? You know, it's always stacked against the Republican, no matter who would've won. It's, the media is like that. And just like the, 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 the ugly hatred, you know, the, the, the obvious hatred. It's like you put on, you know, CNN, and it's like, all right, all right, all right, all right. But I'll flip around and it's like, holy fuck. You know, it's MSNBC and it just, it's like relentless. They can't stand that he beat them because they said he wasn't gonna win. Fed up with traditional media, Scott now gets his information on the internet. You know, I'll spend like an hour, like I said, before I go to sleep. I'll have my phone on and, you know, and I'll go from this to that. And then, oh, Trump made a speech. I didn't hear it today. Let me hear it now. You know what I mean? And, and sometimes it's, I don't even, honestly, I don't look like who's giving it. You know what I mean? Like millions of Trump voters, Scott began believing everything he saw on the web wholeheartedly. For example, this article. Trump believes millions voted illegally. 
or this one, that Hillary Clinton received over 800,000 illegal votes. I'm not saying all three million are, but I'm sure a lot of them are. Absolutely. You should not be able to vote if you are an illegal, if you're not a legal citizen. It's, it's, I'm sorry, but that's how it fucking works. And then they want to change that. I'm like, no, that's not how it works. Obviously, these are all lies. Illegal immigrants can't vote in the United States. False information, characteristic of this election campaign, to the point that these articles now have a name. Fake news. Scott is far from being the only one to believe these lies. Millions have gobbled them up, especially as certain news outlets have made it their specialty. Breitbart News is the most famous of its kind. Trashy style, racist illustrations, and false information. On Breitbart, we can find articles like this. Does feminism make women ugly? Or this. Would you rather your child had feminism or cancer? Breitbart is also obsessed with Islam. The West versus Islam is the new Cold War. Here's how we win. Or... Political correctness protects Muslim rape culture. It's vulgar, misogynistic, racist, and it serves a reactionary ideology, the DNA of Breitbart News. Breitbart is, you know, it's a, it's a right-wing uh, media outlet that was founded by the late Andrew Breitbart, a conservative activist and commentator and uh, journalist. Breitbart is a, a real fringe publication. It's the representative of what they call the alt-right, you know, people who want to take on the status quo of politics, but do so in a very divisive way there. They uh, rail against immigrants to this country. They rail against uh, people of Muslim faith. They, uh, you know, divide, use uh, tactics to divide people on the basis of gender, on the basis of race. In just a few months, Breitbart became the main source of information for the American far right. It's essentially served as um, an organ for sort of the Trump movement. The vision of the world projected by Breitbart was adopted by Donald Trump. He knew it would touch a nerve with his electorate. People wanted to describe the Trump voters as angry. I'm not sure they were angry. I think they were more fearful, worried, concerned, um, scared about, about the future. In the spring of, of 2016, if we looked at the people who were voting in Republican primaries, these people were very concerned about terrorism, very concerned about um, immigration. They, they saw the two of them working together as creating a threat. An ex, almost an existential threat to the, to the United States. Um, and this was something that was being spoken about by Donald Trump, and not necessarily by other Republican candidates. Trump would feed whopping lies to the public during the race, using tweets that played to their anxieties. Ted Devine has been in politics for 40 years. For him, it would be a mistake to think that this fake news has no impact on American electoral behavior. Here's what's happening in our politics. People are consuming information in entirely different ways than we used to. You know, when I started doing presidential campaigns, when Jimmy Carter, you know, was in office, I mean, we turned on the news at, at 6.30 at night and we'd watch three networks at once and that was the way America essentially consumed news. Now there is a constant flood of information, both on television, in the cable environment, and particularly online. You know, th that online consumption of information is having a real effect on things, because what's happening is the legitimate media is being supplanted by, you know, this fake news where people get information which sounds like it's real and true, but has no basis in fact. And in fact, much of it is just made up and delivered, you know, by people who are attempting to, you know, affect the outcome in an election by introducing false narrative and information into the flow of information. So, uh, you know, so yeah, I, I, I think it does have a, a real impact. And, you know, in a close election, that, that effect can, can be decisive. Lying became a political strategy in its own right. 
a weapon of mass manipulation. Hard to believe? According to PolitiFact, an independent fact-checking website, only 4% of Donald Trump's statements during the campaign were true. Used with such frequency by Trump, lies were constantly circulating among his supporters. In fact, they were self-propagating. You have to look at our media landscape and how Americans get their news nowadays. Conservatives get their news only from Fox News or alternative sites like Breitbart. So that's the only news they see. And they view the main, what they call the liberal media, the mainstream media, with distrust. And they don't believe the, the kind of CNN, New York Times, Washington Post. So they are only getting their news or most of their news from very slanted sources. And so uh, what Trump will say, Trump picks up his information from those same news sources. These voters hear something, conspiracy theory on Breitbart News or something on Fox, Trump hears it too, says it, and the voter says, I've, I've heard that, I've heard that on the news, and I heard that from President Trump. So he must be telling the truth. It, they're in a silo, and it's really hard to break that silo. So it's a self-reinforcing cycle of mistruths. The lies were never refuted. On the contrary, they were reinforced. Powerless against this cycle, the traditional press was brushed aside. There's sort of a way that these campaigns have, you know, traditionally been covered, and uh, and and that model of campaign coverage was not sort of created with Donald Trump in mind. Trump's disregard for making true statements uh, is something that a lot of reporters have had trouble dealing with because we're not used to it. We're not used to politicians or um, press people just sort of straight up lying. The mainstream media is disrupted, and because the mainstream media is disrupted, truth is disrupted. And if truth is disrupted, you can just spread your own version of it. Boldly lying throughout his speeches, Donald Trump not only deceived his electorate, he managed to conceal the dark underside of his campaign. Because the Republican candidate was not the man alone he claimed to be. He was supported by an ultra-powerful network, working in the shadows, seeking to impose their reactionary ideas on America at all costs. that corruption has reached a level like never, ever before in our country. <laughs> 8383 Wilshire Boulevard, a chic address in Los Angeles. This anonymous building represents the behind the scenes work of a billionaire on Donald Trump's campaign. Behind these windows, at number 1,000, are several companies that would seem to have no connection. The first is Breitbart News, the fake news website that runs for Trump. The second is called Glittering Steel. It's a small audiovisual production company. But these companies have one thing in common. They are linked to a man that the public has never heard of. A mysterious character. The man behind Trump's win. His name? Robert Mercer. Robert Mercer is 71 years old. He's the CEO of a hedge fund firm, Renaissance Technologies, whose ranks he's been climbing since 1993. Carol Cadwallader has been investigating this computer engineer turned billionaire for the last year. So Robert Mercer is, uh, he is an absolutely brilliant scientist. Uh, he did really pioneering work at IBM uh, in the 60s and uh, in the field of 
natural language processing, which is the base of AI, basically. And uh, he was there right at the start of it and um, working out how to do my machine translation between languages. So that Google Translate, which we use all the time, that is a descendant of the work that he did. You know, he, he is without a doubt one of the sort of brilliant computer engineers of his generation. And uh, he was just an ordinary middle-class guy at IBM doing a professional job. And he got an offer from Renaissance Technologies, this hedge fund, to go and work for them. And he did. In the early 1990s, Robert Mercer left IBM to join a New York-based hedge fund, Renaissance Technologies. There he applied his methods of calculation on the stock exchange in order to predict its fluctuations. At Renaissance Technologies, he pioneered um, algorithmic trading, which now is, you know, a massive field and how much trading is done. Renaissance uh, saw something which still remains a bit secret about how to make profit in markets, but the origin of it is in applying advanced computer techniques to the data without worrying about a theory of where the economy is going or what are the actual meaning of the instruments you're trading. If you're buying wheat futures or if you're buying a car company share, you don't really care that it's a car company or that it's wheat. You just look at the performance of these futures or these stocks. And the key thing was to view this just as a set of numbers. By applying his mathematical tools, Robert Mercer revolutionized Renaissance Technologies' investment methods, making it the world's most profitable fund in 10 years. Mercer became very rich at Renaissance because the performance of the fund, which he had his own money in, uh, was extraordinary. I mean, if it goes up 30%, 35% every year, then pretty quickly you become very rich. So Robert Mercer became very rich. He is also very secretive. He almost never speaks publicly. Sebastian Malabai is indeed the only journalist to have met with him. It was in 2008 when writing his book on hedge funds, More Money Than God. I did go and see Robert Mercer when I was researching my history of hedge funds, and he struck me as shy. That was the main impression, reserved, not keen to look you in the eye. Um, you know, he'd once said, I think, that um, he would be perfectly happy to go through life not talking to everybody, not talking to anyone, uh, that he preferred the company of cats to people. Um, uh, and, you know, that's a phenomenon with computer scientists, that they relate well to the abstract symbols on their screen, more maybe than they relate to other people. And not all computer scientists are like that, but he is one who is. Bob Mercer avoided the company of people and the eye of the media. Even Google has a difficult time producing photos of him. The few that exist are always the same and also a poor quality video. His only public speech in 2014 during a ceremony in his honor. I uh, found out after I decided, sure, I'll accept this award that I would have to make an oration on some topic or other for an hour. Now, which, by the way, is more than I typically talk in a, in a month. As a billionaire, Robert Mercer might have chosen to quietly enjoy his new fortune. However, the former engineer also had strong ideas about how the country should be run. He would decide to invest money to promote these ideas and, most importantly, to enforce them. The political system in America is so broken right now because of the special interest money which floods campaigns. I mean, what happens is when the special interests have an agenda, you know, if you're an oil company, for example, and you'd like to continue, you know, drilling for fossil fuel, uh, you know, or you're a polluter, 
and you want to make sure you can continue to pollute. Uh, you go in and you support politicians who believe in your agenda. Politicians who will say, for example, that you know, climate change is not happening because of man-made activities. You know, they, will, they will promote that publicly because that protects the special interests who fund their campaigns. Robert Mercer has his own charitable foundation, the Mercer Family Foundation, headed by his daughter, Rebecca. But what exactly are the ideas he wanted to promote? Hard to say, because Robert Mercer never expresses his opinions publicly. You, you won't, you'll never know what's going on in Robert Mercer's brain, so just look, therefore, at what he's funding. Follow the money that way. And I think that kind of builds up a picture. If we don't know what Robert Mercer is thinking, let's try to find out what he's been spending. We can do so with tax documents. Declarations of the Foundation's fiscal allocations for the years 2012 to 2015. Mercer financed reactionary institutes and lobbies. Among them, the Heritage Foundation, which fights taxes and economic regulation, $1.5 million. The Media Research Center, which fights leftist media bias, $12 million. The Government Accountability Institute, which tracks government corruption and publishes books against Hillary Clinton, $3.7 million. The Heartland Institute, which defends climate change skeptics, $2.8 million. In New York, he even paid for an ad denouncing the construction of a mosque near Ground Zero. In just two years, Robert Mercer became one of the 10 most influential billionaires in politics, according to the Washington Post. Our system is completely corrupted by the special interest money that is flooding into campaigns at every level of politics. But even if the billionaire was able to spend money to support his causes, he still faced an obstacle. His ideas were judged too extreme. The media didn't accept them. To enforce them, he would need his own media outlet. In 2011, Breitbart News, the right-wing online newspaper, was in great financial difficulty. Robert Mercer saw an opportunity. He bought Breitbart for $10 million. At its head, he placed his right-hand man, a man in the shadows, who was found at all stages of this investigation, a certain Stephen Bannon. Stephen K. Bannon. A former Goldman Sachs trader, he became a Hollywood producer in the late 1990s. He wanted to make films and TV series to promote his political ideas, ultra-conservative ideas. At a conference, Bannon is introduced to Robert Mercer. The two men hit it off immediately. Bannon quickly became Robert Mercer's eminence grease. Mercer and Bannon are very closely associated, and uh, by Mercer associating himself with somebody like Steve Bannon, that may be a, that may be a clue into, his, into Robert Mercer's personal views. In a few months, Bannon would make Breitbart News a war machine dedicated to reactionary ideas. You see that with uh, the Breitbart publications over the course of many years and with someone like Bannon, who just proclaims this publicly, that they're going to take on these institutions and they're going to try to deconstruct the government of the United States to pursue the agenda that they have, which is to, you know, fundamentally change this nation and turn it into, you know, a place where people experience a level of division that I don't think we've seen since, you know, going back to the Civil War. Robert Mercer now had built a political media network. To promote his ideas, he was only missing one thing, a candidate. In 2015, he began by supporting Texas Senator Ted Cruz, figurehead of the American far right. But after Donald Trump's surprise victory in the Republican primaries, he placed his bet on Trump. Robert Mercer created a pro-Trump political action committee called Make America Number One, endowed with $15 million. And the billionaire didn't stop there. He would totally take over Donald Trump's campaign. In 
In July 2016, a dinner is held in a big hotel in New York. It brings together, among others, Rebecca, Robert Mercer's daughter, and Donald Trump in the flesh. During the evening, Rebecca Mercer is very clear. Trump's campaign is chaotic and unprofessional. If he wants to win, everything must change. She offers him financial and media support. In return, she forces the Republican candidate to replace his campaign manager by the family's right-hand man, Stephen Bannon. The chair of Make America Number One, Rebecca Mercer, whose family also funds the Super PAC, um, was able to influence the Trump campaign to hire Stephen Bannon as campaign CEO. At the end of this dinner, everything was decided. Steve Bannon became Donald Trump's campaign director. Kellyanne Conway, who headed the Mercer Political Action Committee for Ted Cruz, became number two. David Bossie, a Mercer family stalwart, became number three. Robert Mercer's takeover had succeeded. His hand-picked trio would, from this point forward, steer the Republican candidate's strategy alone. When the Mer Mercers decide to support uh, a candidate, they expect the candidate to be responsive to their needs, both in terms of uh, how the candidate runs their campaign, uh, and also, also after if, if the candidate is successful and, they're, and they are elected as an office holder, it's reasonable to presume that the Mercers expect that the office holder will be responsive to the Mercer's needs, needs as well and their policy preferences. By taking control of the Trump campaign, Robert Mercer's plan proved successful. Well, almost. He made one mistake. Here's what we discovered when we looked at Donald Trump's official campaign books. Each of these lines corresponds to an expense. However, during his five-month tenure, no trace of remuneration for Steve Bannon. But when we look at the payments made by Robert Mercer's political action committee, one name appears several times. Glittering Steel, a video production company. In total, the company received $302,500 from the committee in five months. And who runs this company? Steve Bannon, him again. So his work for Trump's official campaign was paid via glittering steel. And that? That would be illegal campaign financing. A thesis that's shared by the campaign legal center, who decided to file a complaint. Steve Bannon faced a fine and investigation by the Justice Department, which could put him behind bars. So we believe, or we think it's possible, uh, that the Super PAC Make America Number One was subsidizing Stephen Bannon's work for the Trump campaign uh, by making payments to Bannon through Glittering Steel LLC, uh, this consulting firm slash movie production company located in California uh, at the same address as Bannon's own consulting firm. You know this address, 8383 Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles, the building that hosts Breitbart News and also Glittering Steel. It was here that the murky part of Donald Trump's presidential campaign played out, perhaps to a greater extent than one might think because apartment number 1,000 holds even more secrets. It houses another company, the subsidiary of an English firm that uses mysterious methods to manipulate public opinion in America. There will be no lies. We will honor the American people with the truth and nothing else. It was on the banks of the Thames that the last American presidential election was in part decided, in the heart of London. 
at the headquarters of a firm unknown to the general public called SCL Group, Strategic Communication Laboratories. In these offices, scientists compile and analyze billions of data about individuals in order to understand them. Their objective? To determine what motivates human behavior, the better to influence them. SCL is a company that was founded 25 years ago. They have several branches, a military branch, a commercial branch, an analytical branch, an election branch. What they really do is psychology. So they try to use psychology to influence people. They specialise in psyops, um, which is uh, it's a military term, psychological operations. It's a whole discipline, it's an academic subject. It can be used in different ways. Indeed, on their site, the firm is very clear about its services. These clients include NATO, the British Ministry of Defense, the NSA, or the US State Department. For them, for example, SCL helped identify key leaders in Afghanistan, facilitating US intervention. In another case, SCL organized communications for a vaccination campaign in Ghana. But the company doesn't stop there. Behind the facade, there are other techniques in practice. It's a way of, of nudging people, that's the word, you know, uh, towards better outcomes for them. But it also can be used to manipulate people without them being aware. And it can and has been used by authoritarian regimes. Behind their convoluted methods, SCL clearly offers public opinion manipulation services. The company boasts, for example, about organizing protests in Nigeria in 2007 to influence the elections. SCL also intervened during an election on the island of St. Vincent in the Caribbean in a rather surprising way. SCL elections helped get a candidate elected, hiring people to put graffiti on the walls, creating a problem with youth in this country because their candidate had prepared an answer to the problem. So they really created a problem just so they could then solve it. In short, SCL sets up ultra-targeted influence strategies. And with the advent of the web, thanks to the billions of data circulating, its business would take on an entirely new dimension. And then suddenly what happened, I think in around 2012, is they discovered data. And um, they discovered um, what you could do with data. So to position themselves in this new market, SCL Group would create a new subsidiary in the United States called Cambridge Analytica. The idea is to hide behind another structure, presenting themselves as an English company newly arrived in the US, Cambridge Analytica, who will offer roughly the same services. To create Cambridge Analytica, SCL would partner with an American billionaire, and not just any, a mathematician specialized in data, Robert Mercer. And as vice president of the firm, we find his faithful stalwart, Steve Bannon. From the outset, the objective was clear. Nothing less than a revolution in the way election campaigns were conducted. Despite multiple interview requests, Cambridge Analytica has always refused to speak with us. So to understand exactly what they do, we did something very simple. We watched their ads. Political campaigns have changed. They're no longer about running the most TV spots, sending out the most direct mail, or spending the most money. They're about who spends the smartest money. In today's political world, where campaigns are getting more expensive and elections are won by small but crucial numbers of votes, putting the right message in front of the right person at the right moment is more important than ever. 
This is where Cambridge Analytica and our revolutionary data modeling techniques can help. Put that way, winning an election seems easy. The reality is more complex, and above all, much murkier than Cambridge Analytica is willing to admit. Since coming to the United States, the firm has embarked on an unprecedented operation to compile millions of data on the American population without its knowledge. Here's how. Imagine that inside this car is Mr. X. Like anyone, he leaves thousands of pieces of personal information on the internet without realizing it. His address, his age, his income, his hobbies, his purchases, and also his religion, and whether or not he owns a gun. Cambridge Analytica will buy all of this data from credit companies, banks, social security, but also web giants like Facebook, Google, or Twitter. It's legal, though nobody brags about it. In total, it ends up with four to 5,000 pieces of data for each of the 230 million adults living in the United States. An enormous amount. To see how they plan to use it, just watch the rest of the ad. Traditional political campaigns use geography and demographics like age and gender to break down voters into target groups. This can work up to a point, but it misses the important personal details that really drive voter behavior. We combine geographic and demographic information with up to 5,000 data points of national, political, consumer, and lifestyle behavior for every voter in the United States. Then we add a unique extra layer of data about personality, decision-making, and motivation. This creates an unparalleled, rich, and detailed view of voters and the issues they care about, so you know exactly who to target with exactly what type of message. We call this behavioral micro-targeting. Our team of data scientists, psychologists, and campaign experts can show you which individual voters you need to win over in order to secure victory. No, this isn't some futuristic film. The idea is indeed to give people psychological tests and then compare the results with the information they already have on them, to know what motivates them and thus influence their vote. It's a technique that already exists. One of its inventors teaches psychometrics at Stanford University in California. His name is Michel Kaczynski. Psychometrics is basically a science of psychological measurement. So basically we have noticed that instead of using questionnaires to ask you about your thoughts, feelings, experiences and past behavior such as are you a well-organized person, you can basically look at your digital footprints and see whether you, in fact, are a well-organized uh, person in the real life. Tests to determine a person's psychological traits are called ocean tests. They measure personality based on five criteria. Openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Specifically, it's done with seemingly innocuous questionnaires that can be completed online like these. Which superhero are you? Which Wizard of Oz character are you? What movie are you? In 2008, Michel Kaczynski created the most famous of these tests on Facebook called My Personality, a questionnaire to learn more about yourself. The app became really popular. We had over six million people um, to take the questionnaire and a large a fraction of these people also donated uh, their Facebook profile information to us. And from this information, you can use algorithm, algorithms to transform this information into very detailed and very accurate intimate profiles. As a result, Michel Kaczynski has the largest psychometric database in the world a database he can cross-reference at will with the Facebook profiles of the six million people who responded. Enough data to know a lot about you. So basically you can turn your Facebook likes into an accurate prediction of your political views, religious views, your personality, intelligence, happiness, sexual orientation, or even whether your parents were divorced or not. 
People often ask me how accurate those algorithms are at predicting our intimate traits. And I think that a great example comes from our recent study where we have compared the accuracy of algorithms with accuracy of other people. So what we did, we took uh, friends and family members of our participants and we asked these friends and family members to fill in personality questionnaires in the name of our participants. Now, we would provide algorithm with a set of Facebook likes and have it do the same thing. So based on your Facebook likes, try to predict your personality. And the results of this experiment are staggering. By studying 10 of your likes on Facebook, the algorithm knows you better than your colleagues. With 100 likes, it knows you better than your family. With 230 likes, it knows you better than your spouse. Now, given how much footprints, how many footprints we are leaving every day while, while using internet and playing with our phones, uh, it basically means that computers can clearly know us uh, better in many ways than uh, even our close family members. Computers that combine personal data and psychological tests to predict human behavior? Does it sound like a bit much? You'll see it's not the case. David Carroll is a media professor at Parsons University in New York. He battled for months to retrieve the data that Cambridge Analytica has on him, and he was amazed by what he discovered. This is the Excel spreadsheet that they provided. It is broken into three tabs, core data, election returns, and models. The model is... On the one hand, dozens of personal data that the firm has gathered from the web. Right. And then my registered... Now, this is all the voter uh, data here, and this is what would normally be public in voter records, but it, it's all accurate. It has the day I registered to vote. Mm -hmm. It has figured out my birthday my address, the zip code, down to you know all of my address. It's connected it to census information. It's connected it to all the different kinds of elections. So US Congressional, State Senate, State House, State Legislative. Then you have some consumer information here like the designated mark information. And FIPS is another kind of consumer voter code. Mm. And when you... On the other hand, the psychometric interpretation of his personality. That's how you can really zero in and target. The model is my profile. So you can see the different topics were ranked in order of importance, my registered partisanship, my unregistered partisanship. You clearly see who their client was. It didn't measure me as a Democrat or a Republican, just a very unlikely Republican. Uh, and you can also see sort of the model itself is in the interest of sort of finding uh, conservative voters, especially conservative voters who might be registered as a Democrat, but are actually going to vote Republican. Mm -hmm. So being able to go down to the zip code level and then reassociate that to all other election districts allows you to geo-target uh, so precisely, and that's how you're going to move the needle in U.S. elections. I think if Americans knew this was happening and happening internationally, they would be outraged. Funded by Robert Mercer and headed by Steve Bannon, naturally Cambridge Analytica would offer its services to candidate Donald Trump. By late June 2016, the partnership was a done deal. And on July 29th, the first payment was sent to the English company. You can find it in the campaign accounts. With four payments between July and October 2016, Cambridge Analytica would receive nearly $6 million. At the same time, the Political Action Committee for Donald Trump, funded by Robert Mercer, would also pay $5 million to Cambridge Analytica. Ultimately, the English firm would receive $11 million to work with the Trump campaign. From August 2016, the Robert Mercer election-winning machine was running full speed ahead for Trump. All that was needed now was a strategy to put it to use in the American elections. 
Certainly the, the Trump camp, which includes Cambridge Analytica, saw something in the American electorate that the Clinton campaign and the media uh, certainly did not see. Thanks to Cambridge Analytica's knowledge of the electorate, Trump's advisors would devise a highly targeted strategy based on the particularities of the U.S. voting system. In the United States, the president is not elected directly by the people, but by the electoral college appointed in each of the 50 states. Not all states have the same number of electors, making some states more important to win than others. The Trump camp suspected that they would not win the national vote, so its strategists decided to concentrate on key states. Um, knowing that they would lose the national popular vote, um, how do you win? Well, you win by capturing the Electoral College. How do you do that? You try and figure out a way of where you can go to appeal to relatively small numbers of people. He was going to places that a lot of people thought, why is he doing that? He shouldn't be doing that. He should be going someplace, someplace else. Well, he didn't. There was a strategy of looking at places that had been thought of as consistently democratic states. States like Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, all three of which uh, Mr. Trump carried on, in November. This was a strategy recommended by Cambridge Analytica not to try to convince millions of voters across the entire nation to vote Trump, but rather to target only the tens of thousands that the firm knew, through its analyses, were hesitating. If you are somebody who's as uh, clever as Robert Mercer, and you're just, you're looking, I mean, what he does, algorithmic trading, it's all about finding the tiniest edge is that tiny, tiny, tiny edge that you have over your competitors that you can leverage and make a massive difference in. That's how you make shitloads of money. And I think this idea of using data and the potential for manipulation through a platform like Facebook, is that can just be enough to give you that edge that then you can exploit through things like fake news and all these other techniques and tactics. Here's the technique set in motion by the scientists at Cambridge Analytica. Using the information they had on the electorate, they defined 32 types of personalities throughout the country. They sent thousands of individualized messages targeting those considered to be the most neurotic or worried and therefore susceptible to Donald Trump's messages. The firm identified many such voters in three states. Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Three states they believed they could swing in favor of Trump. In a press release, Cambridge Analytica openly explained its strategy. When, in the final weeks of the race, the firm's data scientists recalculated voter turnout and recalibrated their models to show how Donald Trump could win, the GOP candidate revisited states like Michigan and Wisconsin. There remains one question that the English firm does not address. Just how did they reach these targeted voters? Well, they did it without their knowledge, using a little-known Facebook feature, Dark Post. The idea is that a company or a Facebook page can put out a message for a specific population and that this message is only visible to that group. It will not appear on their own page. In an electoral context, it means that candidates can target individuals on Facebook with negative messages against the other candidate, without journalists being aware, because these messages will not appear publicly. So dark posts are very personalized messages, visible only by the person for whom they are intended. How does it work exactly? Let's go back to Mr. X. Thanks to Cambridge Analytica, Trump's campaign knows he's in favor of carrying firearms. So, it will create a message just for him. Did you know that Hillary Clinton wants to take your gun away? 
and he'll receive this message in his Facebook news feed at a specific time according to his habits and digital fingerprints. No one but him will see the targeted ad, and it will disappear a few hours later. There's no record of them. We've got no way of investigating that. You have no idea who saw what. And this is democracy taking place in darkness. It's not democracy. If you're going to have a political debate, have it out in the open, know who's arguing what and who's being told what. And the idea of just sort of like sneakily targeting people with who knows what on their phones and on their computers um, with anything. I mean, they, you, they could have been saying anything. We'll never know because that's gone. Well, it's on Facebook servers is the interesting thing, but they're not giving it up. This digital onslaught on the campaign was focused on the last few weeks. On November 8th, 2016, against all odds, Trump took Wisconsin by 23,000 votes, Michigan by 11,000, and Pennsylvania by 43,000. In total, 77,000 votes in these three key states carried Trump to victory, when he was 3 million votes behind over the entire country. Cambridge Analytica's strategy had proved effective. We can see that approximately 70,000 voters made the decision for everyone else because they were the ones in the districts that ended up deciding. Ultimately, I think this highlights as well how our electoral college system is a vulnerability, that if software and data allows the most important voters to be easily found, it ends up diminishing the vote of everyone else effectively. Politics and democracy was the next industry to fall. We knew that technology interrupted newspapers and journalism and music, and it was like, actually, here it is. We've been talking all this time about how great, you know, technology is it disrupting things. It's like, oh yeah, we're looking for the next disruptive technology. And I was like, well, actually, this is technology disrupting politics. And, and it's not just politics, it's democracy. And Donald Trump is the great disruptor. Donald Trump's election was not a fair fight. Never has a candidate relied so much on lying and dissimulation. And those who supported him from the shadows have today received their compensation. Robert Mercer's entire cohort, Steve Bannon, Kellyanne Conway, and David Bossy, are now part of the president's inner circle. As for Rebecca Mercer, she herself organized the setting up of the Trump administration. Cambridge Analytica continues to pursue its political work. After the United Kingdom and the United States, the psychometric firm has begun to work with other clients, for instance, in Africa. Its methods are always the same, to target the public and influence the vote without it knowing. So following the example of what happened in the United States, the use of personal data could now disrupt politics in many other countries.